Welcome to the Tactics Meeting Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Smiley, and here on the program, we talk to subject matter experts about response tactics and technology. And today, we have Jim Elliott, Chief Operating Officer from the Teichman Group of Companies, which includes TNT Salvage. We're super excited to have you, Jim. Welcome to the program. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate being here. You're just uh, coming off of some training in Canada where you talked about implementing area command. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. But before we get started, I want to hear a little about you. How did you come to be in the oil spill salvage business? What what was your path to get to this point in your career? So uh, my background is I've spent about 26 years in the U.S. Coast Guard. I started out doing search and rescue and running boats and diving. So I have a passion for being near the water and being underwater. And um, I, throughout my career, you know, I had the, I guess the advantage of being right there at the beginning of OPA 90. So I started out um, as a young apprentice in ICS when the Coast Guard implemented the, the um, uh, National Incident Management System. So I worked through going through my qualifications. So I became a type one planning section chief first, the toughest job in the organization. It is. That is the, that's the job, isn't it? (laughs) It is. So I think everybody should do that job first before they think they can do anything else. And then operations. And then ultimately a type one instant commander. I had the, I was on a strike team. So I traveled around uh, doing oil and hazardous material responses. And uh, I actually did a uh, internship with uh, Titan Salvage at the time before I went on the strike team. So I combined my love of response with diving and it just fell into salvage. So I kind of knew I, that's what I wanted to do when I grew up. And, uh, and then I, when I retired from the Coast Guard, I went right to work with, uh, with TNT Salvage. I've been there almost, uh, almost 12 years and uh, had the opportunity to do a lot of salvage Marine firefighting, oil spill response around the world. So it's been uh, it's pretty pretty awesome. Yeah, it's, it's a good it's a it's a good group of people. Well, that's excellent. Well, today uh, we'll talk about area command, which is um, a topic that really doesn't come up that often in normal ICS classes. We generally deal with a, a specific uh, incident, but we had area command running during the. A BP oil spill um, That's right. and where they were trying to manage resources. I remember when Scott Knutson who was over there came, came down to, uh, to Holma where I was at and we were, you know, trying to reconcile some, some type and kind. He even had the old 2000 Coast Guard fog with him, which had the type and kind uh, index in the, in the back of the, of the handbook. I think that's the only, it wasn't really an IMH at the time, but it was only the only guide that ever came out with any kind of type and kind guidance in it. Right. It was a field operations guide. The fog, I believe oh, it was called. Yeah. Scott, Scott's a superhero. He was trying to, uh, it was dealing with critical resources, right? Dealing with all that boom that was out there. I think I remember seeing him, you know, with his head in his hands, trying to work through all those issues. So, yeah. And the, the idea is that you always want to start right and you want to think about the potential of the incident and then thinking about all those essential elements of information that you want up front. So with Deep Out Horizon, I was there. I was involved in that quite a bit. It's probably why I don't have any hair now, but uh, it, it was a lot of a lot of demands for information and people trying to put things in different boxes that uh, one of the things we teach in incident command and area command is starting right, making sure that you get all those details right from the very beginning. And, and that's often difficult in an emergent, you know, emergency response situation. So what would your definition be of area command? Let's start with that. What is area command? Sure. So area command is the, um, when you have multiple incident command posts, you have multiple operations going on simultaneously. And area command is the, is the uh, command and control structure over those incident commands. So the goal of the area command is is more strategic. Uh, One of the big takeaways is there's no operations section chief in area command, right? They are there to manage the 
support the incident commanders. And uh, the big key that you mentioned about Scott was the critical resources. So if they, if there's, um, you're always working in a resource constrained environment, but if there's, there's specific resources that both command posts need, the area command has to play King Solomon basically and decide based on our priorities where that next section of boom or that next skimmer in an oil spill would go between two large scenarios. So it played out, um, it plays out regularly during hurricane response. So we train, I work with the company, I have a contract, Teichman Group has a company with uh, Mergy uh, Management Services International, EMSI. And uh, that's who I was working with the Canadian Coast Guard um, to, to teach these types of, you know, give this type of training. But the area command again is, and we trained it hurricane responses is another example, right? So for example, Miami area, um, New Orleans area, the, the district level for the US Coast Guard, they set up area command from the beginning. A hurricane's coming in, they know they're gonna have research, maybe resource conflicts, aircraft, boats, those types of things, how they manage that between the, the various commanders in the path of the hurricane. They have a trigger point that automatically activates it for hurricane response. They know they're gonna, gonna need it. In other situations, what would that trigger point be? When when would you decide to activate area command? It's a great question. So for planned events, for hurricanes that you know you're going to be impacted, um, it's a it's a given typically that you're going to have a, a large geographic area. You'll have multiple command posts. So for example, that an oil spill response um, that starts spreading out over a larger area it may start out with one instant command post and then go to two. There was a case in, um, in the Gulf of Mexico, it's called the Texas Y incident where it started in Houston, oil came out of the channel and went all the way down to Corpus Christi and you had multiple command posts. That, that trigger would be, um, could be the critical resources that you have conflicts. It could also be political right or stakeholder issues it could could bring in so when a when it is a commander is focused on the tactical operations or looking just 24 hours ahead in an operational period typically the area command can provide that what i'll call top cover uh, for an incident commander from a public uh public information stakeholder uh, and and also looking for creating a strategic plan like what is the next, uh, what, what is, how, does, how will we achieve success in this operation? Um, so it's, it's very, you know, different things uh, can trigger an area command, but it's more difficult once you, like you said, like with Deepwater Horizon, where that horse had already sailed with all those critical elements of information, right? That trying to go back and say, okay, we need to collect this amount of data, this type of information, these types and kinds, two weeks into it is very difficult. So it's 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 on the really on the incident commanders. When you teach an, an incident commander course, you say you, one of your first jobs is look at the potential of this incident. How long is it going to last? What is the political framework you're working in? What are the, all of the stakeholders uh, that you're going to be dealing with? Do you need uh, do you need that support, right? And and I when I've my experience, you know, thirty years of plus of doing this is that oftentimes response is not the best technical solution. It's it's an exercise in civil society, and you have to appreciate that public information side, that stakeholder, all of those things, and maybe ask for support. I mean, as an incident commander, I mean, in a hurricane responses, I encourage a individual as a commander to reach up to the next level in the chain of command and say, I need your support. Here's what I will need as we roll out. I'll be focused on the tactical operations. I need your help with the, you know, the strategic portion of this response. So area command doesn't have an ops section chief. They're not doing operations. Do they have a, their own PIO? Is there a public information officer, liaison officer? The staffing within the area command? Yes, yeah, so, so you can have an area commander uh, or a unified area command, uh, say if there's a state 
or um, another organization involved, Canada. We put together a unified command based on their province and their Canadian Coast Guard. Um, maybe a First Nation would be pulled into that um, into that uni unified area command. And they, they would have, you mentioned public information, same concept. You would have a joint information, a JIC, a joint information center, and you would want to align and have one voice for the operation. So you can imagine that if you had, let's look, the ideal state for, for the Deepwater Horizon was that you would have you have multiple command posts across Louisiana, Alabama, Florida, and that the Unified Area Command was speaking with one voice for the entire operation. That's the concept, right? So with a so, hurricane on. So for example, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, you may have Texas and Louisiana impacted. You would have an area command over that, and they would be they would be on the line with national media discussing that and providing providing that support for the instant commanders. So would they take the role of JIC liaison out of the hands of the individual incident management teams that were working their discrete portions of the response? I, as an incident commander in Louisiana, work in the coastline, no longer have to worry about Joint Information Center uh, activities because it's been moved to area command? How does that work? So it, it really depends on the decisions of the area commanders and the instant commanders. Uh, a lot of times, so you'll still typically have the, um, in the instant command post, the ICS organization, you would still have, they would still have the command general staff running the tactical operations, the next operational period. And the area command public affairs would reach out and support the public affairs locally. So they may divide it up, say you take the, you take the local news, we'll take the, the regional national news, we'll create, and they work together to create a, uh, you know, present the overall operation as a unified front. That's the goal. But you don't, you don't exclude, you know, you don't take away, I have never seen where you take away totally public affairs from the local level or stakeholders, because you're always going to have local stakeholders that need need to be listened to, need to be supported, need to be brought into the organization. And um, you certainly don't want, from a stakeholder issue, you don't want to have that person you know, three hours away at an area command post. You want them right there locally supporting the, the local command. If you do decide that you need a unified area command, how do you so decide how large that's going to be? It's a very good question. And I think that everyone struggles with that, right? And there's always a the question of who's in charge. So my goal when I'm advising or in a unified command or area command is to keep that, keep that as small as possible, keep it as tight as possible, but yet listen to the needs of every, every agency that's involved. Um, you know, you, you need to step back to say, any, whether you're an instant command post or area command, do you have jurisdiction to make these decisions? You don't lose that, you know, the Coast Guard doesn't lose their jurisdiction and their authority, right, over that whenever you're involved. One of the, one of the you know, the test is can you, can you spend money on this operation? If you, if you can't commit resources to that response, you probably shouldn't be in the command structure. So again, jurisdiction, authority, ability to provide those resources. And that's often, it's often a difficult discussion. I mean, I was just in Canada, uh, we had this discussion this week. So there's a, um, there's an organization within the government, I won't name names, but they say we want to be in the unified command. But yet they've never been in that role before. But you know, it, you know, a lot of people want to be in charge. Um, and, and so that, that rolls out at the local level, you find it with, you know, with a local agency, municipal fire department, whatever they, they, you know, you can bring them in for that portion of the response that they have jurisdiction authority and they're committing resources to. So it can evolve also. 
Um, but it is a big, you know, it's a philosophical issue that many have struggled with. My experience, I mean, if if you are the the landowner, you certainly should probably be in that if your land is going to be impacted. So, for example, in the in the U.S., the National Park Service, if it's if it's a an incident on a national park impact national park land, I one of the I was just working with the National Park Service and we discussed this. Oftentimes, they're not brought into the EFI command. They find out, you know, my my philosophy is if if you are the landowner, your land is going to be impacted. You certainly have a stake, and and you should you should be brought into that unified command. So you understand how your land is going to be impacted. You you know more about you know you know more, more about your property than anybody else. So if there's an endangered species, there's any type of issue there uh, that you can bring that, you know. So there's there's. And, and I would say there's probably people listening in that would say, you know, I wouldn't bring them in. I, they would be in the environment, right? So so we can have those discussions. And I'll sound like an attorney, but it often depends on, obviously, geography, political situations, those types of things. Sure. What is different about the planning cycle for the area command versus the incident management team? Great question. So... Within the uh, within ICS, you're familiar with the planning P, right? You go through and to do the uh, the uh, command general staff meeting, create your objectives. Uh, objectives are given to ops planning command staff. They create a tactical plan. They create and then that goes into the instant action plan once everybody gets. So at the area command level, you have a area command management plan. It's not a it's not a, it's an action plan, it's a management plan. And so it starts out with a, an area command is formed. So an agency executive or someone senior in the organization will say, we need to, we need to get some oversight, some control, some strategic uh, planning for this operation. We have a lot of critical resources. There's a lot of conflicts between the command posts. So we're gonna set up this area command. So you, we we like to see a designation letter right for the area commander and i i like to see that for just really the scope of work for this one incident uh, that prevents mission creep so that the area commander can focus on their scope of work and also outlines how much expenditure authority they have i know that when i was an incident commander during katrina it was very stressful because we were, you know, we were spending obviously a lot of money and I never had that really clarified for me personally. What is, what is, how much money can I spend on this? Right. So I like, I like to see that. Um, and then once you have the, the organized, then they meet with the incident commanders, they create their own objectives or strategic objectives to achieve success. And then they meet with their incident commanders and, and work together to form that management plan. Okay. So is there, is there really a planning cycle, like a diagram in the same way that ICS has one, or is it, Oh, look at that. There it is. There is a, there, there is a planning P for the area command. Yes, that's, that's nice. Because I'm looking at Chapter 14 of the 2014 Incident Management Handbook, and it's not there. It's not. No, there's almost exactly. nothing in here. Oh, look, there's Area well, Command. You should probably learn it's more a about one, it. It's, it's like three pages. Chapter. Yeah, yeah. It's a very short chapter in the Incident Management Handbook. Very short. So uh, the doctrine I would say is continually evolving. I think the the uh, the Coast Guard. If uh, I'll I'll make an advertisement for their app. Um, they have an app that you can get a, um, do you have that? I do, yeah. I have it. I didn't look to see if it had area command information in it, but I'm about to Well, it has it the right same incident management handbook, but it also has the area command job aid. So you can go get that, or you can work with uh, EMSI. I'll, I'll give them a, a shout out. They've developed their own uh, area command is job aid. And it, it outlines that you can carry that around. It walks you through that whole uh, um, management plan process. Oh, perfect. So if anybody from EMSI is watching the podcast, email me. Send me a copy. I want a copy. Maybe I'll they'll, send. Maybe they'll do it. Maybe they'll send me one. 
I have an I have an extra one to carry around with me, so I'll send you one. So you have that. So you can become an expert in area command officer. So <laughs> it's unlikely that I'll ever be in area command, but I might be on the incident commander side of that meeting. That's right. So I, you know, we teach. You know, I've I've taught an incident commander course for advanced incident commander course for the Coast Guard for several years. Obviously, the incident commanders should know how the area command works how what to expect from the air command and uh, they should know that an air command is being formed before it is actually implemented right you don't want to be surprised that you get a call oh this is the air commander and you're like wait a second nobody told me this was coming right so right. And, and we're and we're and those four skimmers you have out there we're taking those right exactly yeah yeah. Oh, by the way, we're moving some of your right. Your that dispersed aircraft you thought was going to land in like an <laughs> hour, not coming. <laughs> right. So that's the uh, as with any response, communications is is key. Right. If you read any after action report for a exercise or an actual incident, one of the lessons is we always need better communication. So we encourage as soon as an area commander is knows that they're going to become an area commander, they call those incident commanders and say, hey, we're all in this together. How can I help you? Oh, by the way, we have some resource conflicts. Can you tell me what your critical resources are? And then in the planning process for that area management plan, they go through and that, you know, I, won't, I don't want to get too detailed, but in the, in the uh, incident planning process, you have the 215, that work assignment list where you, dev you know, what we, what we have, what we need, those types of things. You do the same thing only with critical resources at the area command level. So there's, again, there's no operations in area command, but you are looking at the overall strategic picture of multiple incidents. And then in that resource constrained environment, you're saying, what are those critical resources? And the area command or unified area command has a difficult decision of saying, I'm sorry, I have to pull your dispersion aircraft because the higher need is at this location. We're, you know, with Scott, you mentioned Scott at the beginning. I believe one of his goals during the Deepwater Horizon event was to find containment boom and resources, critical resources all over the world, right? He was trying to find out. We were in a resource constrained environment. Every state wanted additional resources. How do we find those? How do we bring them in without impacting, negatively impacting the rest of the US, right? There was all those discussions going on. Well, that's that's the difficult job of the Area Command. Well, that's why, you know, Scott was the, the first person who created in the Pacific Northwest, the, the Whirl, the Western region response. That's right. You know, it, which was originally a, an Excel spreadsheet now uh, now a database that is maintained by for free by by Gen West a little plug for them they put a, a lot of effort into that thing and they've never charged a, a dime to anybody for for maintaining it and it's the, you know it's the first place that you can go to find some of these resources and more and more people uh, more and more organizations put their resources on there MSRC's resources nationwide are there uh, WCMRC in Canada's resources are there. Uh, NRCES now U.S. Ecology's resources are there. I don't know. I don't recall whether uh, TNT Salvage has resources listed on the world or not. But it is a great, a great resource. And anybody listening to the show who doesn't have their resources on the world, get them on the world. No, I think it's a best practice nationwide. I mean, we you know we do. I think. So T, speaking for TNT, we have, you know, we're OSRO and a salvage marine firefighting service provider, but we also have this non-floating oil OSRO classification. So yes. I work to put those resources in there, but again, a, a best practice. So we work with different ports around the country, marine firefighting. We're trying to create databases to make sure that, and, and align expectations for when there's a, a major event, right? So the, that all comes to play. And it's, that would certainly help if you're in an incident that you would have all those resources listed. You're, I mean, Scott's an expert, you know, resource 
leader, leader, whatever. He's he's the superhero when it comes to that. And uh, he would be able to, and that, going back to the basics of ICS, when you're ordering something, the first person you go to is that person. Say, hey, do we already have this in inventory? Yes. Okay, let's move on. When you said cross-border, it kind of uh, triggers something. And the discussion we've had this week with Canada, I mean, that's, they've actually exercised area command for cross-border incidents. And I've been involved in, you know, cross-border response operations, but they're taking it to that level. I think they, they uh, working with the uh, Canadian Coast Guard, they, had, they did one a few years ago in Maine. Right, and they actually put an area command in place there. So, they are though the, you know, the U.S. Coast Guard is. I think I started teaching ICS in the mid '90s, uh, and they've gone through this whole implementation pro process. Uh, the Canadian Coast Guard didn't really adopt it until the 2010s, early I believe, and they're they're fo really following the U.S. Coast Guard and a lot of the doctrine. And, Instant Management Handbook. I, they have their own Instant Management Handbook, but it looks mysteriously like so I got it here. The U.S. Coast Guard Instant Management Handbook. Same chapters, same format, um, and the same you know the same process. So I, it's pretty uh, pretty good. Obviously, that they speak the same language. We can come together and do a response together. So it 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 prevents all that a lot of the friction in organizing creates order out of chaos. And I know you're a believer in that when it comes to ICS and that we're all speaking hopefully the same language and then we can just focus on getting the, you know, a successful response, so. Well, I, hope, I, may, I might be the beneficiary of your work. Uh, Co U.S. Coast Guard just started the planning process for Can U.S. PAC for this year. And uh, WISMIC is gonna be the RPIC, and so I, I'll be the responsible party incident commander for Can US PAC this year. Do you have a Canadian incident management handbook? I don't. Are you going to send me one of those too? I could probably get you a copy of one of those. Yeah, be, man, definitely. It's, it's like going to the bookstore. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm here. That's what I do. I just share information. It solve solve people's problems. Solve problems. You, you're probably familiar with this best response model. I don't know if you've seen the best response model where you have these key business drivers that you have to achieve in every response and, you know, safety of life, minimize environmental impact, keep the waterway open, reduce impact to the economy, and then stakeholder and public information, communicating with your stakeholders, everybody that has a stake that has a concern, bringing them in, listening to their needs, and communicating effectively to the public, right? And I have never seen an incident commander fail doing operations. Operations are gonna happen, right? You got a lot of good contractors that are gonna go out and they're gonna fight to get on the response. So they, they, wanna, they, wanna get, they wanna get on the, in the game, right? But where I've seen incident commanders actually fired was their lack of understanding of the political realm of the operation, the public realm, and the stakeholders. And that's that's kind of what Area Command, I think that they can provide. They can have that step back, look at multiple incidents and say, okay, what what is really happening here? You know, we got we got our guys doing the tactical operations. We need to look at that strategic perspective of how do we achieve success from a political perspective from a stakeholder perspective, from managing the media, and you have the whole component of social media that I'm sure you, you if you haven't already, you probably do a podcast, but just managing social media during the response. Um, so, yeah, so the, that's the value of the area command. And, and as an instant commander, I mean, I, I would value that. You know, you, you wanna build that relationship between the area commanders Obviously, it's kind of boss management. You want to help help them help you, um, but that's the value of an area command when you have multiple incidents going on. They can provide that oversight, strategic oversight, and they're not only planning for the next operational period; they're looking over the horizon to what is the closure of this multi-incident response. 
So you're saying that incident commanders should not be offended that area command is stepping in. They should be thankful and embrace what area command can provide. Yes, I think that's, do they have a choice? <laughs> Maybe not, but. Right, right. So they should value, you know, I'll, I'll just speak from my own experience. The, uh, during Katrina, I was, I was kind of a, I was a junior incident commander at the time. I was managing multiple salvage operations around. And, and there was a, the joint field office when you have a staff or event, a large uh, multi-agency organization that comes together, FEMA. And they were calling me, asking for me for information. And I was like, so what do you do? Because I was ignorant to the fact that what does this new joint field office do? And so I, that, my lesson from that was don't, don't fight it ask them for help, bring them in to help. What can you, what resources can you bring to bear on me? Here's what I need. So from, from that experience, from that friction that I, I went through in a very stressful situation, I said, okay, I teach incident commanders, ask for support. So for example, during Hurricane Ike, if any of you remember Hurricane, Hurricane Ike, the entire Gulf of Mexico, hurricane, you know, covered in a hurricane coming toward the Houston ship channel destroy you know wiped out an entire area of the gulf um texas coast uh i was working with the incident commander for that and we were on the line before the hurricane hit and i said look ask for everything ask your boss we got on the call with the area commander said ask for everything ask for attorneys critical incident stress management chaplains because you're going to have responders that lose their homes you're going to have people you know it's going to be catastrophic i, I have my experience with katrina you know, ask for all these things you need. Get the strike teams here immediately. Get an incident management team. Even the little things like um, have a scribe, have somebody right beside you that's going to write down all your decisions because you will not have time to do that. You know, so ask for all that. And and invariably, no, no it doesn't make you look bad. It makes you look like you've planned for a bit. You know what your gaps are, and your area commander is going to be there to help. Yes, we're going to get you that, right? So that was my lesson from you. What do you, you learn your lessons from the school of hard knocks? Yeah, you do. That's where you learn them. Don't fight and it. You, and you hope you, you hope that you survive so that you can go on to do the next thing, right? That's right. That's <laughs> the knock isn't so hard that it knocks you out. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, that's why, you know, I'm, I'm about four foot tall now and I don't have any hair. So I, I've, I've kind of been knocked out, <laughs> you've, you've but been I keep a, going, right? You've been whacked a couple of times. Well, you know, times, if, yeah. if, if, you know, if you've never been whacked, you're actually not in the game. You're a spectator, right? You, that's right. That's, that's the thing. So any <laughs> final advice for people with area command? Anything we didn't cover that you think we should mention? No, I mean, if you're interested in, uh, there's, area command courses. We're going to teach it for the Coast Guard and the Canadian Coast Guard, teaching it around the world. Um, so the courses are available. If you're interested in getting that to that level, um, there's job aids that you can you can get if you're interested in scanning through what that process is that we talked about. And um, and appreciate if you're ever an instant commander, you're ever in a unified command, appreciating that, you know, the area command has a job to do. They've been an agency exec executive, someone that is assigned that area commander to do a job, help them do their job, work as a team, communicate, communicate, communicate as you're going through this process and, uh, and work together to achieve success. You know, make sure that your objectives align with the area command's overall strategic objectives. Excellent. Well, Jim Elliott, ICS guru, chief operating <laughs> officer from the Teichman Group. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us. Thanks so much. It was a pleasure to be here. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Tactics Meeting. If you'd like to be a guest on the show or have a topic that you'd like us to cover, feel free to email us. Our email address is podcast at the Tactics Meeting online.